Perfect. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, this first uh, technical talk of the day. Um, today, I wanted to talk about data frames because it's probably something all of you already use in your day-to-day -day lives. Uh, just a bit of perspective about who I am and why I did that. So uh, yes, I am a retired researcher. I actually left academia right after my PhD defense. Um, now I work in a company called Dataiku. Uh, that's a software vendor who uh, basically edits uh, a platform for people who click, people who code. Um, FYI, we are hiring. And well, in our product, we do have something that is called the flow. The flow is basically a graph that allows you to recursively build objects, should it be data sets, models, but in between those buildable items, you have, well, tasks to execute. And most often, to execute those tasks, you will rely on code. Very simply put, you have one or more input data sets. You're going to write code to, well, read that data, process it, and then write the result somewhere else. That's a very simplified vision of data processing, of course. But the point is that between the data and the code, there needs to be an interface. And this is where the data frame comes in. So when I started as a data scientist back in 2017, everybody was reading that book, Python for Data Analysis, that was basically the user guide for uh, the well-known Pandas library. Fast forward, well, to November 2022, we are now at Pandas version 1.5.2, which has gone a long way since Pandas 0.1, which was released according to PyPI on December the 25th of 2009. And in between, of course, well, there have been many other contenders to actually allow people to use the data frame framework to manipulate data. Quick disclaimer, the talk of today is not going to be a benchmark for all of those. Uh, there already have been a few, actually, uh, talks in PyData um, about uh, comparing the performance between these guys. What I wanted to do is a bit more different, in a way. I wanted to look at a technical view of a few of them and not really compare how they do in terms of, well, raw performance, but instead try to understand what they mean in terms of user experience, what they mean in terms of like what's happening under the hood, both in terms of memory management and, let's say, execution frameworks. And of course, given the fact that well, we are limited on time today, I picked uh, four of them, of course, Pandas as a base reference, um, and also, so Dask DataFrame, Modin, and Polars. You will, will understand why I picked those uh, additional three later on, but that will be our menu for the day. We're going to start with uh, probably the most important part, which is the APIs and, let's say, more generally, the user experience. How does it feel to write code when you're using any of those frameworks? To understand that, before diving into the specifics, it's important to take a look at what a data frame is from a data structure perspective. And it's actually something fairly, let's say, singular if when you look at it, because when you look at the data frame, it's basically something that is double-indexed. So it has, so any data item inside a data frame has two labels, a label uh, re um, relative to the row and the label relative to the column. It also has a type, and let's say almost all of those frameworks, when they are implemented, they assume that the data structure looks something like this. Let's start with Pandas. And uh, yes, you're going to see a bit of uh, code today. Fortunately, this is not code that I'm going to execute live, so no demo effect. You will have to trust me on that. Um, but we, if we start with uh, Pandas, well, all in all, it's quote-unquote nothing more than just, well, a dictionary of series object, uh, where you have basically the column names uh, as labels in that dictionary, as, yeah, as dictionary keys, sorry. Um, well, accessing the data is where it becomes interesting, because probably 
most of you know how to access data in Pandas, but you may have your own favorite way of doing it. We can even try to like make a, a show of hands. If we were to access, let's say, one column inside Pandas, who would go for option number one by attribute? All right. Who would go for option number two with dot lock? Who would go with option number three dot ilock? All right, so there is no best way of doing it, of course. Uh, that's the point. Um, depends on how you're going to write your code, of course. Um, but my point here is that, well, Pandas offers you options. Question is, well, what's the best way of doing it? Is there a right way of doing it? That's the thing. When you start implementing many ways of doing the same thing, especially within the same tool, then you have your users getting a bit confused. And even when you start looking into doing something simple as a beginner, you're like, OK, but I see that there are many other ways of doing it. I'm going to take some time to think it through and to come with the most generic and most efficient solution. I suppose everyone knows what happens next. You get stuck into this rabbit hole of finding uh, a global optimum that may or may not exist, but you end up not doing something even simple. That's one of the main pitfalls. And if you take a look at, let's say, the size of the Pandas API, you run this uh, curl command in a terminal, the result will be over 200. There are more than 200 uh, pandas dot something something items that are documented. That's a lot. So when you have so many options, of course, you are free to do things. But well, with that freedom, can come also a bit of complexity. So here I have listed a few, not really anti-patterns, but things that can be done potentially in a better way. So I am French, as you can uh, guess with my accent. I like to complain about stuff, as you have seen <laughs> in the previous presentation. Uh, so I will mostly complain about not just Pandas, but also the other libraries out there. But there are also a few good things. So take things uh, with, a, let's say, a grain of salt. First of all, well, as a beginner, when you start using Pandas, you're like, OK, this is really cool. I can write these uh, fairly convoluted uh, lines of code. And you start going what is called uh, the mutation pattern. You're like, I'm going to define one object, I'm going to perform operations, and then I'm going to define another variable that will take that object and do something else, and so on and so forth. Thing is, under the hood, you're going to create a lot of objects. This is going to take a lot of memory. This is not going to fare well if you are working on limited resources. Instead, people uh, would advise for a pattern that is called chaining, which is something that looks like functional programming, for those of you who are a bit familiar with it. The idea is actually fairly simple. You're like, OK, those operations, they take data frames as input, they return data frames. So we're just going to chain them under the same variable so that we're not going to actually um, mutate the initial object into multiple variants. In instead, we're going to chain those operations. I will show you an example later on of how it looks. But most often, people can get stuck in this mutation pattern. Then you also have this attribute in several uh, methods. In place equals true. I assume you, know, you all know uh, what it is. Who uses in place equals true on a frequent basis in their code? Don't be shy. <laughs> So yes, it is an interesting attribute because it allows you, indeed, instead of creating a new object, to mutate uh, an existing one. That being said, if you say, OK, I'm going to uh, adopt the chaining, uh, the chaining pattern, the chaining pattern assumes that you're going to return a data frame for the next operation, kind of like when you're piping things in, uh, in Linux. Here, in place equals true breaks that because it returns none. This plus the fact that you think that it's not going to create duplicate items, think again. It won't create duplicate items when it can, but when it cannot, it's actually going to copy at least part of the data. So if the argument of using in place equal true is to save memory, it's not entirely true. 
who uses the dot apply function? So, uh, second question, which of those two lines do you think is the most efficient one? The second one, right? It's also the simplest one to read, actually. And that's, again, the, the problem with complexity. When you realize that you can apply an arbitrary function to part of your data frame, you're like, okay, that's cool, and you kind of get stuck into this sometimes unnecessary complexity. But there is also the fact that Pandas will do what it can to actually vectorize computation and make it run more efficiently. And dot apply actually blocks vectorization. So when you can, if the function that you're trying to apply is, well, simple and can be translated into simple arithmetics, prefer the simplest option, so the second one, because those quote unquote native operations will run faster. So this is one thing. And please, 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 <laughs> don't use for loops. Uh, it's even better if you use dot apply. I, I will not mind like replacing for loops with dot apply, but please, please do not use for loops because you will entirely forfeit any possible optimization uh, by doing so. For loops or any, uh, let's say, standard uh, iterative way of manipulating the data. There are some built-in things in Pandas that will take care of things, but again, that's the thing. When you don't have like one way of doing things, sometimes it can be confusing. And believe me, I have my like, colleagues who are not from the data science world. Well, they're from well, computer science, software engineering. Their first idea when they see a list of series, they're like, okay, I'm going to iterate with a for loop. No, please don't. <laughs> So, an example of doing things, so this, um, this query is actually using uh, bike rental data. If we were to like apply the chaining pattern that I mentioned earlier, the idea would be to do something like this. So actually have just one object that you create, but then you're going to chain the operations by applying some filtering and processing here, for example, then doing a bit of aggregation, and then doing sorting and returning the object itself. So I am an average uh, Pandas user, so I don't claim that this is the most efficient way of doing things, but it was, in a way, a good illustration of the, uh, of the chaining pattern. What about the other ones, uh, Modins and Dask data frame? For those, it's going to be quite easy because they actually take the, the Pandas API, either as a, well, uh, a subset of their API, or they try to replicate it. In the case of Modin, their goal is, in fact, to replicate 100% of the Pandas API. What they want to do is actually to build an efficient drop-in replacement for Pandas and ensure full compatibility. That's one way of looking at things, and that's an interesting one, especially when you want to avoid migrating code to a new framework. However, they're still not there yet. It's quite a lot of work. Remember, there are a lot of uh, things uh, in Pandas itself. And even like some of the, the main methods haven't been, let's say, ported yet. So if you, if you were to try um, the previous code sample that uh, we, we showcased, be careful because especially the sorting part is not there yet. And the problem is that when there is, you know, this part of the API that you hit that wasn't ported, it's not failing gracefully. Instead, it is falling back to Pandas, which is completely destroying the performance because you're copying objects in memory. You have to copy a modin object into a raw Pandas object and then move on with the operation. And this is costing a lot, a lot in terms of performance. For Dask, it's a bit different. They acknowledge that their goal is to use just a subset of the Pandas API. They're not going to replicate it entirely. Uh, they explicitly say in their website that full coverage is not in their roadmap. Uh, that being said, they're also fairly transparent on the fact that uh, some of the things that were ported are still expensive in terms of performance. Anytime you need to re-index things, anytime you need to sort things, uh, you may uh, encounter let's say, performance issues, but at least they are a bit more transparent about it. And if you were to actually uh, replace Pandas by uh, Modin or Dask, um, this code sample, which is the exact same one as uh, in the previous slide, well, it actually works out of the box. 
So that is actually a, a good thing. If you were to migrate a huge code base that has pandas, at least taking that small and hopefully representative sample, it kind of works out, uh, out of the box. Then comes Polars. Polars is a bit different because uh, they made the choice to basically discard the Pandas API in favor of something much simpler and more composable. And they also introduce two types of APIs, a lazy one and an eager one. I will get to that later on. But they made this choice to offer, let's say, a simpler experience to, uh, to the user. They also wanted this chaining pattern to be a first-class citizen in how things are done. Uh, but the problem is that, of course, if you are to migrate from Pandas to Polars, you will need to rewrite your code. Next, we're going to talk about memory. Uh, that can be a complicated topic, especially when you come uh, from a data science background. Uh, so we're not going to go too deep into the details. Uh, that being said, it's important to, uh, to look at because looking at Pandas, all in all, you need to think of pandas as basically a collection of uh, NumPy uh, array that are stored in memory. NumPy has its own way of storing things in memory, uh, which has a few implications. The first one being that, well, uh, it, NumPy was built for numerical computation, but what happens when you have to deal with more complex slash different types, especially in the case of strings? Uh, in the world of Python, strings are boxed objects. They're stored as Python objects on the heap in memory. And that leads to something that is called pointer chasing, because to read strings in a sequential way, you will need, in a way, well, to simplify things, to travel a lot in the memory. This leads to potential overhead and not an efficient way of handling uh, stuff like string data. Same thing when you load data into a data frame, out of the box, pandas will do a bit of type inference. But if you really want to limit the amount of memory that you're going to use and consume, it's always more interesting to actually manually do the type parsing, maybe also to change a few types, reduce the number of, uh, I don't know, bits uh, in which your integer data is encoded, for example, if you want to save memory. But this is still manual work. It's not, let's say, handled by the pandas inference, pandas type inference. Modin and Dask, again, a simple approach. They're basically concatenated data frames. They're reusing the, yeah, the, the pandas memory representation, and they are using those data frames as partition, and meaning that you are going to partition a Modin data frame or a Dask data frame into several uh, smaller pandas data frames, and then dispatch them to the worker processes or the worker, yeah, the worker processes, should they be local or remote, so that they can be processed in parallel. So that's a common pattern for the, the two of them. Um, a quick word regarding partition. When it comes to defining how big should the partition be and how many of them should there be, um, in the case of Dask, you have the ability to fine tune that because given a certain point in scale, we'll need to adjust things to optimize performance. Uh, Modin took the choice of actually uh, keeping it transparent and uh, preventing in a way the user from tweaking this a bit too much. In the case of Polars, they're using something called Arrow. So who is or has heard of the Apache Arrow project? All right, everyone, I, don't, I will not have to explain things too much. In a way here, we're focusing on something very specific, which is the Arrow columnar format, which basically allows you to represent data in memory in an efficient way that will allow uh, basically uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, better sequential scans, because you will have data that is, uh, let's say, in a way contiguous in memory. You will also have more optimizations around vectorization and a lot of interoperability because having one way to represent the data in memory that has compatibility with different uh, tools in the stack or uh, programming languages will help a lot and will avoid potentially suboptimal, let's say, uh, adaptation codes to move from one framework to the other. Something else is that um, Polars was written in Rust. Who knows about the Rust programming language? So who writes Rust code? 
So that's for a reason. Basically, Rust is not a language for data science per se. That's a systems programming language that's very low level. Um, but the reason why uh, Rust was chosen was especially to take care of the potential memory problems, especially when it comes to copying the data. So uh, Polars has what is called copy on write, which means that you will be able in this implementation to actually efficiently quote unquote, copy the data. What does it mean? You have a data frame, you want a copy of it, but you're just going to read it. You're not going to alter the data, the data frame. Uh, in REST, you're going to do something that is called a borrowing operation, which means that you're going to create a reference. Uh, if you want to write uh, something, if you want a, a mutable copy of it, then you will have a mechanism allowing you to do so, but in the process, it will also check that it is the only mutable reference. Otherwise, you will have some, a tool that is called the borrow checker that is going to tell you, yes, but no, you're going to break things if you try to uh, mutate things like that. So you will have built-in guarantees to uh, have basically uh, free uh, cloning for read-only, and you're not going to break anything if the source is, in a way, uh, altered by one of the references because they, there can only be one mutable reference. Last, um, about the execution model. So, well, Pandas is single-threaded, so I assume you've all experienced this kind of feeling when you feel like uh, things are going really slow on your uh, laptop that has, I don't know, 16 cores, and you're like, come on, uh, this is, is that all you've got? But thing is, well, there is only one core working. Uh, Pandas is single-threaded. That's uh, the joys of working with Python and the global interpreter lock. Uh, Pandas also only support what is called the eager execution uh, type, meaning that, well, when you execute something, when you write code, it will be executed in this exact same order. There will not be any additional thinking. That's really nice in the case of data science because you all know that when you open up a Jupyter notebook, it's nice to have this you know, interactive way of doing things, of exploring the data and whatnot. The thing is, in a way, First of all, it encourages anti-patterns like mutations and whatnot that we've been uh, talking about at the beginning. But it will also, you know, act in a way that you're going to do first and think next. At some point, you need to flip that around and say, if I need to do a bit of thinking, and if I'm not doing, let's say, the, the thinking part, at least the engine that is taking care of processing my query should be able to do so. When you look at something else, like Dask, you have something that comes closer to what you would see in, for example, a database when you're building uh, an execution plan, meaning that you're going to take your query, that query will be translated into something, something that is called a task graph with a few optimizations on the way, and then that graph will be sent to what we call schedulers. That's also where you need to make uh, a distinction between uh, Dask data frame and the Dask scheduler. Das, uh, the Dask scheduler is a way to run workloads in a distributed fashion, either locally or on clusters. Uh, that's one way of doing things, and in building this graph, you will also get uh, optimizations on the go. Same thing with Modin, uh, and here it's even more, let's say, obvious. Uh, the query is going to be taken by the query compiler, and then it's going to be translated into the internal language of Modin, which, is, which they call the data frame algebra. And again, on the way, this assumes that you're going to have optimizations uh, done by the engine, so that at the end of the day, when you're going to push that computation, that optimized computation, to the actual, let's say, infrastructure part, should it be handled by either Ray on the bottom right or by uh, something else like Dask, which is also compatible, then at least you will have something, quote-unquote, simpler than the initial query that you have submitted. Um, in the case of Polars, same thing. Uh, the query will not be executed as is. There will be query optimization as well. And they put an emphasis on the, um, the support, what they like to call the support for modern CPU architecture. The sense that any time you have the ability to vectorize computation, you will be able to do so, because this is built in in the library to take advantage of uh, the capacity of modern CPUs to be able to actually 
uh, efficiently run operations that can be uh, executed in a vectorized way. And on the right, you have other examples of, in a way, uh, graphs. Uh, on the top, you have the unoptimized graph, and on the bot at the bottom, you have the optimized one. Again, this is fully handled by the engine, meaning that you only need to say, OK, uh, show me the graph for optimization equals false, and then the one equals true. Uh, and then, of course, when you execute the query, it is done with the optimizations. And this really translates into, uh, let's say, uh, noticeable gains in terms of performance. So that was a lot. Um, but in a way, it was an interesting take because a lot of the content that you have on the internet in presentations, they are about comparing performance. Uh, I wanted to take kind of a different approach. Uh, so in a way, you can think of this talk as kind of a nice prerequisite to move on to the performance comparisons next. Um, well, but we're not done yet because we forgot one thing. Uh, now it's kind of a new trend to say, OK, we have databases, and we don't want to write SQL code. We want to write Python code. And we want to write Python code in a data frame friendly way so that, well, first of all, we, act, we leverage a language that we all know and love. And second, all of the optimization part, all of the scaling part will be handled by the database itself. So you have several uh, technologies and uh, projects that are uh, currently, well, um, available or in the works. Um, my favorite one is probably the, uh, the IBIS project, uh, because uh, the creator of Pandas, Wes McKinney, is actually involved in this one. The idea is to write something that is data frame related and that you can actually apply to arbitrary um, backends. Should it be Postgres? Should it be Snowflake? Should it be any other database? Uh, and you, you don't want to write SQL. That's the same idea for Snowpark Python uh, and uh, DuckDB. They are in an in-memory database that will allow you to write SQL, of course, but also to transfer uh, your code to something that looks like, not really Pandas, but something that has a data frame interface. Uh, but the, uh, the engine itself will still be uh, the database. And well, last but not least, um, you have realized that we have uh, gone through a lot of details in this talk, technical ones. Uh, it is my belief that at some point, uh, as uh, practitioners of a tool, uh, we have to go beyond just using the tool and take some time to understand what is going on under the hood. In the Netherlands, I know that people love to bike, but I also know that uh, probably the most experienced bikers, well, they will, they will know how to replace parts in a bike. They will know how a bike works. I, I hope, my hope is that uh, we achieve that same uh, status for uh, the data science uh, domain, where you have data scientists not just using tools, but also understanding what it means to compare that with uh, the theoretical way of how a database work, understanding how the memory is handled, understanding uh, API design and whatnot, because all of those, even if it's hidden when you use a tool, it's part of your day-to-day -day life. And it's, uh, as, a, as a closing way, a nice, uh, nice follow-up if you want to push, for, uh, push further your uh, career as a data scientist and just beyond the day-to-day -day data science work, understand a bit more what is running inside your computer or your cluster. I'm almost finished on time, so thanks for your attention. <laughs> and if there are questions, we still have yeah, time. Nicely within time. I think you made all of us a bit self-conscious about our pandas code now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so lots to think about. Do we have any questions uh, in the audience? Ah, Marijn, go for it. There, you can have the cube. You have to talk into the... Little. Into the thing? Oh, yes. Okay. There you go. See? First of all, lovely talk. Secondly, when I was a junior, I remember monitoring my CPU constantly when I was loading in a large geodata set because I might blue screen of death myself. The juniors that I train nowadays don't even know what the blue screen is because CPU <laughs> capacity and cloud computing went so fast. So my question is, are we getting lazy? <laughs> um, so probably. <laughs> so. It's interesting because so uh, I work as a developer advocate in my company, but I'm also in charge of technical enablement. And when I have to explain what is under the hood, sometimes people are like, but I never saw that in school. And like, well, maybe it's, uh, it's a good first step, I'd say. Um, but it's also the goal of the ecosystem, you know, to abstract away the complexity. It's just that at some point, there is a threshold. 
in which you need to actually gear up and say, okay, I want to be more efficient, then I'm going to open the hood and see what is going on. Thank you. Are there any questions? I think I saw some hands here. Oh, all the way in the back. You think you can reach all the way in the back? Can you hold up your hand and be ready to <laughs> catch? Oh, oh. <laughs> Was it was it, it was it was a decent throw? <laughs> Can you hear me? Oh. You got it? Yes. There we go. <laughs> Good catch. Good catch. Yeah. Uh, thank you, first of all, for this nice overview of all uh, these uh, packages that we have. I, I started as a, like uh, working with Python is like about six months. But I'm wondering, like, for your type of works that you do, what kind of combination of these uh, packages you use to scale up a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, the performance? So uh, at Dataiku, we actually use Pandas. Uh, we use Pandas as basically a universal <coughs> interface because at the graph that I show in the beginning, the idea is to give users access to the data in the form of a data frame, not in the form of a CSV file or a SQL uh, table and whatnot. We build actually an abstraction layer on top of that so that like, regardless of the data source, people only manipulate data frames. Uh, and even though I have my complaints against uh, Pandas, the thing is, it's an industry standard. And that is actually something that you can't really fight. Meaning that if Pandas is used everywhere, then it becomes kind of a standard. Uh, all of the packages that I've shown, so Modin, Dask, uh, Polars, and whatnot, pushing that to production will be kind of, a, not really a long shot, but uh, people will be a bit more uh, afraid of doing that versus trusting Pandas, which is uh, fairly old and battle-tested. So there is the performance question, of course, but there is also the usability and the reusability. If you have a pool of users that is already familiar with Pandas and that needs to move forward, especially when it has uh, links to production-related projects, then yes, by all means, you can stick to Pandas. Otherwise, my favorite one would be Polars. Um, but uh, the other two, so Modin, Dask, and e even the other one, like Red Frames, Vex, and whatnot, they all have their advantages. It will really depend on the use case, the size of the data, and the level of experience and familiarity uh, of the data scientists who are going to use them. I think we still have time for another question. If there's, uh, oh, there's a, okay, up there first. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Polars. I think it's awesome. When I discovered it, I was like, oh my god, how did I miss that? So thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention as well. But my, I struggle a little bit of trying to convince others to go from Pandas to Polars, right? So I play around with it. I see it's fast. I, I looked under the hood. I'm a big fan. But it's not the standard. So how do you kind of convince people to say, it's OK to embrace change? How, how do you tell people <laughs> that? It's a deep question. And I have 27 seconds. <laughs> Um, well, um, again, it, it depends. Uh, for me, uh, Pandas is there to stay. That being said, it's not an excuse not to innovate. Uh, if you want to take a look at something like Polars today, it's not really to push code in production with it tomorrow. It's more to understand where can be the benefits in the long run. And once you have that, then you can go to your boss, and the boss can go to their boss and say, OK, now we have a case for it. Let's experiment. Let's do a POC. Let's uh, replace parts of the stack, and then go progressively. Uh, replacing Pandas in one day, that's comp complex. Uh, that's why you have so many libraries that actually aim for full compatibility in terms of the API. That's already reassuring. <coughs> but otherwise, it's, yeah, it's betting. It's innovating. That's something you need to keep doing. As a company, as a startup, as an enterprise company, you have to keep, do, keep it doing, but you also have to keep the lights on, and for that, you need your production projects to, to run. So, yeah, find the balance between both. It's hard to dethrone the king, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then that's it for time. Uh, all your remaining questions, uh, you're still around for today, right? Yep. So uh, you can ask your questions actually now, because we have a short coffee break. Um, Next talk starts at 10.55, so if you want to be here, for, be here at 10.55 or in any of the other rooms on time, 
Um, thank you again. Thank you.